Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Kremlin News First at Four. I'm Tom Sherry. Welcome, everyone. I'm Whitney Ward. We want to get started right now, mm -hmm. taking a look at the forecast because we know very high, potentially mm -hmm. dangerous winds are moving into the inland northwest tonight. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, you can see the anemometers <laughs> yeah. out there just spinning around out on Lake Coeur d'Alene, <laughs> along with that uh, that uh, uh, you know incredible rain that we've had today. So the wind advisory is in effect, as you can see, everywhere shaded in yellow. That includes Spokane and Coeur d'Alene area in the Spokane and Coeur lane area. It's in effect until four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The strongest winds will be from 2 a.m. to 4 p.m. And because we've had so much rain and warm temperatures, we've got an avalanche warning in effect uh, across the Cascades and the uh, northern uh, uh, Okanagan Highlands. You've also got, uh, again, that wind advisory in effect across areas of western Montana as well. We also have a flood advisory in effect across Spokane and down into the Palouse, mostly just into agricultural areas. But again, it's we've got a lot of wet, wet weather and a lot of snow melt going on with the current temperature there of 44 miles an hour. Not really strong winds right now. Strongest winds are to the south of us. Uh, as you can see, 18 mile an hour winds down in Pullman. Again, it'll be after midnight tonight and a little bit later on in the broadcast, I'll actually show you a look at the uh, uh, the, the uh, computer models of when we think the strongest winds will occur. Just a little bit of light rain. Boy, after a soaker today. So 39 the overnight low. We continue with extremely mild weather tomorrow. Again, very windy overnight into tomorrow morning and then a high of 48 degrees. The average high is 34. For the weekend, we start cooling back down, though. We'll see daytime highs in the upper 30s. We are lucky enough now to have our own Thomas Patrick, who is out in the storm tracker, and he is checking on the windy conditions and also the flooding conditions. Thomas, what are you seeing out there? Yeah, Tom, actually just only a slight breeze right now. And uh, as you mentioned, we're under a wind advisory and a flood advisory right now. And almost ironically enough, it's not all that rainy and not all that windy, at least not yet. But as you mentioned, the strongest winds are going to be very late tonight, early tomorrow morning, and then pretty much all day tomorrow. And that's going to be the priority of our forecast because the stronger the wind skits, the more impacts and implications that we can see, particularly when it comes to tree damage or even power outages. I'm in the Manitou Park Boulevard area. In fact, this is Manitou Park behind me. Of course, a very heavily wooded area. So and an area that's always been susceptible to wind damage and tree damage in the past. But here's kind of the kicker because it's been so wet recently. Notice how muddy it is, especially on the ground here. I'm not going to go stand in that. Get my brand new shoes all muddy up. But here's the thing with that softer soil, softer ground, it's softened the foundation of a lot of these trees. So even though tree branch damage, if a tree branch falls on a power line, we can get power outages. But with more violent and severe winds as they are forecasted, especially if they get into that 60, 65 mile per hour range, well, those kinds of violent winds could actually push these trees and uproot them completely simply because the ground has been so wet. As for the flooding concerns, that's more so a river type event because some of the mountains are actually seeing snow melt in addition to the rainfall we had earlier today. But at least we're enjoying a small break from the rain and wind, at least for now. But we'll be keeping an eye on things as the winds start to ramp up all throughout the evening tonight. Reporting from the Spokane South Hill, meteorologist Thomas Patrick, back to you. All right, Thomas, thank you so much. We know you guys will both be keeping an eye on all of this. Avista also keeping an eye out. They're getting ready for this storm already. So here is what they are doing. They've got warehouse supplies in place. Assessment teams and wire guard teams are standing by just to keep the public safe near those potentially downed lines. Plus, they also have tree crews that are prepared to respond as well. The power company wants to warn customers, though, if widespread outages do happen, estimates for restoration may not be available until after the storm has passed, and they warn be prepared now mm -hmm. because it could be a matter of a couple of days, depending on how the outage is in your area. And we certainly are no stranger to these right. types of conditions, so we know that it can last for a while. You bet. Something else to keep an mm -hmm. eye on for sure. In the meantime, tonight, a Grant County mm. Sheriff's deputy has passed away after contracting COVID-19. John Melvin had severe symptoms, fever, shortness of breath, and tightness in his chest. Yeah, fellow deputies say that he pretended he was okay to save them from worrying. You know, he just he kept reassuring everybody from family to agency that he's good. I don't need anything. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Mm. Hmm. Well, family members were concerned about his well-being, and when he didn't pick up the phone, so colleagues went to check on him, and they found that he had passed away. Our Morgan Trow spoke with the sheriff's office about this deputy and his legacy. She will have the full story for you tonight on Creme 2 News at 6 o'clock.
Well, as the number of COVID-19 deaths pushes closer to 400,000 in America, the Trump administration unexpectedly announced today it will stop holding back second doses of the COVID-19 vaccines. Now, that's the same approach that President-elect Joe Biden announced yesterday. Federal health officials are asking states to start vaccinating people older than 65 and others at high risk. And with only about 9 million doses administered to date, they are warning states to pick up the pace or they're going to get less vaccine. This new system gives states a strong incentive to ensure that all vaccinations are being promptly reported. Now, mass vaccination sites are starting to pop up all across the country. That's including Arizona, New York and California. Some of those hard hit states right now. All of this as yet another variant of the virus has been detected now in Japan. Health officials say it was discovered in four people arriving there from Brazil. And over in northern Idaho, actually all of Idaho today, Governor Brad Little gave an update on the state's vaccine push. Little expressed hope that the state's progress so far. We're in the final stretch of our pandemic fight. This is a truly uplifting sense that we have turned a corner. And I want to thank all of you for your perseverance over the last 11 months. Health officials in Idaho also announced they expect the number of vaccines that providers in the state will receive each week. That will increase as well. The Central Valley School District is discussing ways to bring students back to in-person learning. While an official date is still being worked out, the goal is to bring all grade levels back, including middle and high school students. Leaders say it plans to follow guidance from the Spokane Regional Health District. It plans to bring back, four, uh, bring back fourth through sixth grades this month, and seventh through twelfth grades will go back starting February 1st. Families will also have the choice to continue distance learning. And as part of the local push to get kids back into the classroom, Spokane Public Schools is hosting a webinar for parents of third and fourth graders. That's coming up tonight, and they'll be discussing the phase in plan for those students who will be heading back here in the next few weeks. That webinar will start at 630 this evening. You can find the link to that meeting on the SPS website right now. We also have a link on our website. Just go to creme.com. And the Spokane City Council is formally endorsing Spokane Public Schools levy. However, there is organized support from people upset for the district not opening fast enough. My thought is that the city council needs to stay out of it. The voters will make this decision, absolutely. So we always do this, and I can just speak for myself. I support this. We're going to lose jobs if we don't do this, and we're going to have to cut services to kids. This is a replacement levy. That means that this is not a new tax. However, it is a tax increase. The owner of a $250,000 home paid $1,755 this year. Next year, if passed, the owner of a $250,000 home will pay $1,850. The levy is up for public vote February 9th. The second round of stimulus checks now being delivered a little bit differently, and that is actually causing quite a bit of confusion. Yeah, they're being sent out on Visa debit cards, and some people have been throwing them away, thinking it was some sort of scam. Mark Hanrahan joins us now to preview this story that we're working on for you on Creme 2 News at 5. Good afternoon, guys. This round of COVID-19 stimulus money was sent out a lot quicker than it was last time, but if yours didn't come by way of direct deposit, it's likely coming on a Visa debit card, and many people weren't expecting that, so we spoke with a local couple who were confused when they got one in the mail. I would have thought that the government would have let folks know to be on the lookout for something like this if it was coming in a different payment form. The IRS said it mailed out about 8 million of these cards, but not everyone will get them. Some people will still get those paper checks. Coming up tonight at 5 o'clock tonight, our Amanda Rowley explains what to look for in the mail and show us how you can access your money from that card. Tom Whitney, back to you guys. Well, the FBI is warning of an armed protest planned at all 50 state capitals leading up to the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden. 10,000 National Guard troops are already in D.C. tonight or they're on their way, and that number could go up to 15,000. The Washington Monument has also closed now, and the Park Service says it may shut down other public areas over the next few days. A seven-foot non-scalable fence is one of the new security measures in place, and it surrounds the U.S. Capitol and is meant to keep disruptors from even getting near the buildings. The mayor of D.C. is also asking people to just stay home. 
Our goals right now uh, are to encourage Americans to participate virtually uh, and to protect the District of Columbia from a repeat of the violent insurrection experienced at the Capitol. President-elect Joe Biden says he is still planning to take the oath of office, though, on the west front of the Capitol building. And Justice Department officials are asking those who participated in last week's Capitol riot to voluntarily come forward, warning that the cases brought so far are just the tip of the iceberg, meaning there will be many more arrests. Of those 170 cases that have already been opened, and I anticipate that's going to grow to the hundreds in the next coming weeks, we've already charged over 70 cases. We're looking at significant felony cases tied to sedition and conspiracy. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling for known rioters to be placed on the no-fly list. And in the wake of the assault on the Capitol, some of America's biggest corporations are also now distancing themselves from lawmakers. More than a dozen Fortune 500 companies have suspended their political donations. Hallmark, for example, asked for a refund from Republican Senators Josh Hawley and Roger Marshall. The company says the senators' decisions to vote to reject state's certified electoral college results do not reflect our company's values. Other major firms like Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Facebook, Google and Microsoft all are going even further. They say they will withhold all political contributions from members of both parties. Mm. Coming up here on Crime 2 News at 4 tonight still, a little girl in Montana saw a police officer get injured in the riots in D.C. It just made me feel, feel bad. So she sat down and wrote him a heartfelt letter. Hear from her and her mother coming up after the break. 